Morning everyone. Greetings from Montana. Today I'm going to read from a book that seems kind of timely at, right now. Um, it's about the cult of personality. It's a novel called All the, All the King's Men by Robert Penn Warren. Um, Warren won the Pulitzer for this in 47 and um, it's loosely based on the story of a, the governor of Louisiana, whose name was Huey Long. Um, Willie Stark is the main character in this book, and he also is the governor. It's told from the point of view of one of his right-hand men. And um, like a lot of powerful, successful, personable men, Willie Stark... Uh, does very well for himself for a while, becomes a little bit too blown up by this power that he has, and uh, the results are sort of predictable. Um, All the King's Men was made into a very successful movie uh, with Broderick Crawford playing Willie Stark, won Best Picture, and I think he might have won Best Actor too. And then, of course, later on, when uh, Woodward and Bernstein came out with their book about the Nixon administration, they played off of this title, calling it All the President's Men. So I'm going to read a couple of short sections from this. Um, this is told from the point of view of one of um, Stark's right-hand men, so it's got a lot of colorful, sort of offensive language from that time period, so I'm going to try to avoid that. Um, but there, you'll see there's a little bit in there. There were pine trees here a long time ago, but they are gone. The bastards got in here and set up the mills and laid the narrow gauge tracks and knocked together the company commissaries and paid a dollar a day. And folks swarmed out of the brush for the dollar. And folks came from God knows where, riding in wagons with a chest of drawers and a bedstead canted together in the wagon bed. And five kids huddled down together, and the old woman hunched on the wagon seat with a poke bonnet on her head and snuff in her gums and a young one hanging on her tit. The saws sang soprano, and the clerk in the commissary passed out the black strap molasses and the sow belly and wrote in his big book. And the Yankee dollar and the Confederate dumbness collaborated to heal the wounds of four years of fratricidal strife, and all was merry as a marriage bell. Till all of a sudden, there weren't any more pine trees. They stripped the mills, the narrow gauge tracks got covered with grass. Folks tore down the commissaries for kindling wood. There wasn't any more dollar a day. The big boys were gone with diamond rings on their fingers and broadcloth on their backs. But again, good many of the folks stayed right on and watched the gullies eat deeper into the red clay. And a good handful of those folks and their heirs and their assigns stayed in Mason City, 4,000 of them more or less. The boss was sitting in the front seat with Sugar Boy and watching the speedometer with his kid Tom up there with him. Tom was then about 18 or 19, I forget which, but you would have thought he was older. He wasn't so big, but he was built like a man, and his head sat on his shoulders like a man's head, without that gangly craning look a kid's head has. He had been a football hero, and the fall before he had been the flashiest thing on the freshman team at State. He got his name in the papers because he was really good. He knew he was good. He knew he was the nuts, and you could tell from one look at his slick-skinned, handsome brown face with the jawbone working insolently and slow over a little piece of chewing gum, and his blue eyes under half-lowered lids, working insolently and slow over you or the whole damn world. But that day, when he was up on the front seat with Willie Stark, who was the boss, I couldn't see his face. I remember thinking his head, the shape and the, the way it was set on his shoulders, was like his old man's head. Mrs. Stark, Lucy Stark, the wife of the boss, Tiny Duffy and I were in the back seat, Lucy Stark between Tiny and me. It wasn't exactly a gay little gathering. The temperature didn't make for chit-chat in the first place. In the second place, I was, I was watching out for the hay wagons and gasoline trucks. In the third place, Duffy and Lucy Stark never were exactly chummy. So she sat between Duffy and me and gave herself to her thoughts. I reckon she had plenty to think about, 
For one thing, she could think about all that had happened since she was a girl teaching her first year in the school at Mason City and had married a red-faced and red-necked farm boy with big slow hands and a shock of dark brown hair coming down over his brow. You can look at the wedding picture, which is, has been in the papers, along with thousands of other pictures of Lily, and a look of dog-like devotion and wonder in his eyes when they fixed on her. She would have had a lot to think about as she sat in the hurdling Cadillac, for there had been a lot of changes. We tooled down the street where the little one-time white houses were and hit the square. It was Saturday afternoon and the square was full of folks. The wagons and the crates were parked solid around the patch of grass roots in the middle of which stood the courthouse, a red brick, red, red brick box, well weathered and needing paint, for it had been there since the Civil War, with a little tower with a clock face on each side. On the second look, you discovered the cl that the clock faces weren't real. They were just painted on, and they all said 5 o'clock, and not 8.17 the way those big painted watches in front of a third string jewelry stores used to. We eased into the ruck of folks come in to do their trading, and Sugar Boy leaned on his horn, and his head twitched, and he said, Bab, bab, bastards, and the f spit flew. All the King's men, Robert, K Penn, Robert Penn Warren. Have a great day, everyone.